As you're getting seated, I invite you to open your Bible with me to Romans chapter 3. If you forgot your Bible or didn't bring a Bible with you this morning, then you can reach underneath your seat and grab one of those Bibles and open it with us. If you don't have a Bible, we would love to give you a Bible. And there are free copies of uh, a Bible out at the Visitor Center. And if you don't have one, we want you to have one of those and take it home with you so that you can bring it with you to church every week because we want to open God's Word together. And if you are new with us this morning, we are in a series this fall called Discipleship Explored, where we are looking at what it means to be followers of Jesus, looking at what it means to be disciples. And this morning, we're going to be looking at a passage that is such an important passage of Scripture, because I believe this passage is one of the greatest summaries of the gospel that you will find in the New Testament. Uh, Romans chapter 3, and I will be reading verses 9 through 31. So hear now the word of the Lord. What then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside, together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave, they use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes." Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be, count, be, may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also, since God is one who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. And Lord, We thank you that the sum of your word is truth and every one of your righteous rules endures forever. And so, Lord, we pray that you would impress and imprint your truth upon our hearts this morning so that it would endure in our hearts and transform our lives. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. What is it that makes Christianity different than every other religion in the world? How would you answer that question? Uh, There are a lot of ways you could answer that question. You might talk about how Christians believe in a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, whereas other religions don't have a concept of a triune God. You might talk about how Christians believe that Jesus is the Son of God and not just a prophet or a great teacher, and that would make us distinct. Those would be good and valid answers, and you could give other good and valid answers as well. But another way that we could answer the question, how is Christianity completely distinct from every other religion on the planet, is in its explanation of how a person is saved. The various religions of the world, if you study them, 
They have different ideas about what salvation looks like, but they all have one thing in common, and that is that they all teach in one way or another that a person is saved by what we do. So, for example, Muslims believe that you must follow the five pillars of Islam in order to be saved. And at the end of your life, if your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds, then you will go to heaven. Uh, Buddhists believe that you must follow a life of discipline and follow the eightfold path. And if you have enough discipline, then you just might reach a state of enlightenment. But it's all up to how much discipline and work you put in. Similarly, Hindus believe that you have to live a life of works and devotion. And if you do that enough, then you will climb your way up the enlightenment and the reincarnation ladder. Every religion, if you look at them all, assumes that we reach this point of salvation or enlightenment or heaven or whatever you want to call it by what we do. And that's what makes Christianity unique. It is the only worldview, it is the only religion that teaches that we are not saved by what we do or what we have done, but we are saved by what someone else has done for us. Or to put it another way, a disciple, as we're talking about disciples in this series, a disciple of Jesus is a person who understands that salvation is not a reward to be earned, but it is a gift to be received. And that's what we're going to see as we look at Romans 3 together. This passage, as I said already, is one of the clearest explanations of the good news or the gospel that you will find in all the New Testament. And what Paul is going to show us in this passage is the way in which we can be righteous. But that righteousness, as we're going to see, does not come from us. It comes from being in Christ. So let's look more closely at these verses together. The first thing Paul shows us is the need for justification. And I'm going to explain what that word means in just a minute. But look at verse 10. In verse 10, Paul quotes from Psalm 14, and he says, What then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all, for we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one, no one understands, no one seeks for God, all have turned aside, together they have become worthless, no one does good, not even one. Paul's describing here what is the fundamental problem in the world today. The fundamental problem in the world today, according to scripture, is sin. God created the heavens, he created the earth, he created you, he created me. He created us to know him and love him and glorify him and obey him. We are accountable to him for how we have lived our lives, but the Bible says that instead of obeying God, we have departed and followed our own design. We have rebelled against our creator, and the Bible calls this sin. And Paul says, all are under sin. And because all are under sin, it just naturally follows from that, that none are righteous. If all are under sin, then none are righteous. We stand before God, in and of ourselves, guilty of sin and deserving of his judgment. It is if God is the divine judge of the universe and we stand before the divine judge and we are guilty. And so one of the central questions that the Bible seeks to answer is, is there any way that we can be acquitted before the judge? Is there any way that a sinful man or woman can be made righteous, can be accepted by God? Our greatest need is to be justified. The word justify, here's what it means. It means to declare righteous. To declare righteous. It's an image that actually comes from the courts. And when a judge acquits a defendant, he is in effect declaring that person to be righteous and therefore free from any punishment. We need to be declared righteous. We need somehow to be acquitted of our guilt so that we can be accepted by God. But there are two problems. And the first problem is that unlike a regular defendant in a courtroom, there's no question about whether or not we are guilty. In a normal in a normal trial, you know, a defendant, they're they're trying to determine whether or not this person is guilty. In our case, that's not an open question. It's just a fact that we are guilty. It's already established. So that's our first problem. The second problem is there's nothing we can do 
to justify ourselves or to acquit ourselves or to make ourselves righteous because we don't bring anything to the table. So there's no question of our guilt and there's no ability in and of ourselves to make ourselves righteous. No matter how many good works we do, we still remain guilty before the judge. And so the question becomes, if we cannot justify ourselves, is there any way we can be justified? So that brings us to Paul's second point, which is the source of our justification. Even though we cannot make ourselves righteous, we cannot justify ourselves, he says there's a new righteousness that has been manifested or revealed. The righteousness that has been revealed, he says, does not come about from looking within yourself. This is a mistake that some of the various world religions make today. They say, if you want to find uh, freedom, if you want to find salvation, look inward. The Bible says that's the exact opposite direction that you want to look. Righteousness, the, the, the righteousness we so desperately need does not come from looking within ourselves. It comes from outside of us. Look at verse 21. He says, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift. Paul says a new righteousness has been revealed. And notice two things about this righteousness. First of all, he says it's apart from the law. It's been revealed apart from the law. In other words, it's not achieved by following God's law and keeping his commandments. As Paul already said, all human beings have failed to keep God's law. So if righteousness and being made right with God were achieved by following God's law, no one would be able to be saved. But this righteousness comes apart from the law, he says. And he also says, secondly, that we are justified or declared righteous by what? His grace. By his grace as a gift. In other words, we can't establish our own righteousness, but the good news is that righteousness is not a reward to be earned. It's a gift to be given by grace. Even though we stand guilty before the judge, he's saying there is righteousness that can be received, but it can only be received as a gift by God's grace. Now, what on earth makes that possible? And that leads to the third point which is that Paul shows what the ground of this justification is. When I say the ground of this justification, I'm saying this is what accomplishes it. This is what makes it possible in the first place. And the answer is it's, the ground is Christ's work on the cross. Look at verse 24. He says, we are justified by his grace as a gift through what? Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. What does it come through? What makes it possible in the first place that we can have this? It comes through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. It becomes because God sent Jesus as a propitiation. Now, I know that you have used the word propitiation a lot this past week, so I don't need to explain what that means. That's your favorite word, right? No, it's a foreign word to most of us. So what does it mean? The word propitiation means a sacrifice that satisfies God's wrath. It is a sacrifice that satisfies God's wrath. When Jesus died on the cross, he was not just bearing our sins, he was bearing the punishment that we deserved for our sins, which is just another way of talking about God's righteous wrath in response to, to our sin. He endured that on our behalf. We just sang about that a few minutes ago when we said the words, Tell on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. Sin must be punished. God cannot just look at sin and ignore it. If God ignored sin, he would be unrighteous. We would say there's something wrong. We, we know this to be true in the world today. If there's a judge or, or, uh, who, who ignores uh, someone who's guilty, or let's say a police officer who just turns a blind eye to crime, we say there's something wrong with that. That's, uh, that's not righteous. That's not right. Similarly, if God were to ignore sin, he would not be God. He would not have integrity. He would not be holy. He would not be righteous. God can ignore it. Sin has to be punished. Jesus stepped in to receive the punishment, the judgment that we deserved. 
As the prophet Isaiah says, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his stripes we are healed. When Jesus died on the cross, he was receiving judgment for sin. But whose sin? He didn't have any sin of his own. So it couldn't have been judgment for his own sin. It was judgment for our sin. So here's the main point. The only reason we can be justified and acquitted is because someone else was judged in our place. Essentially, you might say the judge was judged in our place. The son of God stepped in to take the punishment we deserve. And that is why Christ's death is the ground of our justification. When Christ died on the cross, he was judged in our place. In the words of theologian John Murray, he said, God loved the objects of his wrath so much that he gave his own son to the end that he, by his blood, should make provision for the removal of his wrath. So then that brings us to the fourth thing here, and that's the instrument of justification. Paul says we're justified by his grace as a gift. The question is, how do we receive that gift? How does it become ours? How do I receive the gift that he is talking about here. And the answer is the instrument by which we receive this justification is through faith. Notice if you look back on this passage, several times that word faith comes up. Verse 22, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. Verse 25, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. In verse 26, it was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Over and over again, we are told what justification is through faith alone. It is by grace alone and it is through faith alone what does it mean to have faith though in Jesus first of all it means trusting in the person of Jesus as the object of our faith faith from a Christian perspective means trusting in the person of Jesus as the object of faith because listen faith is not inherently valuable there is nothing inherently valuable about faith If I went downtown and I climbed up to the roof of the U.S. bank building (laughs) and I I decided um, I'm going to jump off the U.S. bank building, but don't worry, I've got an umbrella, so I'm just going to float down like Mary Poppins. (laughs) Uh, You would say, I was crazy, and you would be absolutely right. (laughs) Because, I mean, that's that's faith. That's putting a lot of faith in an umbrella. Um, But that's not a good place to put your faith. That is not a good object for your faith uh, because we all know what is going to happen. Faith is not inherently valuable. The question is, what is the object of your faith? What are you placing your faith in? And faith from a Christian perspective, saving faith is trusting in the person of Jesus as the object of my faith. And secondly, faith means trusting not only in the person of Jesus as the object of my faith, but trusting in the work of Jesus to save me, trusting in his work on the cross, recognizing that it is only through his blood shed on the cross that I can be saved. Theologian Martin Lloyd-Jones puts it this way. He says, the man who has faith is the man who no longer, is no longer looking at himself and no longer looking to himself. He no longer looks at anything he once was. He does not look at what he is now. He does not look at what he hopes to be. He looks entirely to the Lord Jesus Christ and his finished work and rests on that alone. That's what we mean when we talk about faith. Faith is the instrument by which we receive the gift that has been given. And so that brings us to the fifth thing I want to mention this morning, and that is Paul talks about the result. What's the result of justification? Now, we could say a hundred different things about this. I just want to point out two things that he specifically mentions in this passage. And the first is, this first result is that boasting is excluded. Verse 27, he says, Then what becomes of our boasting? It is is excluded. What is boasting? Boasting is expressing pride in yourself. 
When we boast, we are showing the world, here's where I find my self-worth. Here's where I place my identity. When we boast, we're, pres- we're expressing some kind of confidence in ourselves. And we're saying, I am somebody because of these qualities within me. Or because of these things that I have done or that I have accomplished. But when we understand that we're justified through faith in Jesus, there's no longer any room left for any boasting. Why? Because salvation had nothing to do with me. And if it had nothing to do with me, then I have nothing to boast about, right? And it has everything to do with Christ. Tim Keller puts it this way. He says, Paul is saying that boasting and believing are opposites. You can't do both. The principle of faith excludes boasting because faith understands there is nothing we do that justifies us. If we are to receive Jesus, we must give up boasting. You cannot cannot boast and believe at the same time. You've got to choose one or the other. Because if you believe in Jesus, boasting is out the window. Because you contributed nothing to your salvation. It's all a gift. If we're going to be saved, we have to give up our self-identity. We have to give up our self-sufficiency. We have to give up our self-security. We have to give up our self-confidence. We have to give up ourselves because we recognize there is nothing we can do to save ourselves. We can only cling to Christ and what he has done for us. To quote again from Keller, he says, We only exclude boasting when we realize that our best achievements have done nothing to justify us. To boast in them is like a drowning man clutching a fistful of $100 bills and shouting, I'm okay, I've got money. (laughs) Isn't that a good image? (laughs) It's crazy, but that's what we do, just not in that way, right? We think that there's something in and of ourselves, but it's completely Irrelevant. He continues and says, if you know you are saved by Christ's work alone, you have great confidence, but it's not self-confidence in your own works. Rather, it is Christ's confidence in his death. What's the result of justification? He says, first of all, boasting is excluded. And second of all, God's law is upheld. Verse 28, Paul says this. He says, we hold, for we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. And he goes on to say, this applies to everybody. See, I don't care if you're Jew or you're Gentile. I don't care what what country you come from. I don't care what race you are. He says, this applies across the board to everybody. We hold that one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. And so then the next question, and Paul knows exactly what people are going to say. The next question they're going to say is, okay, well, then does that mean you've just thrown the law out the window? Does the law not matter anymore? Have you just nullified the laws if God doesn't care about it? And he says, no, no, no. Verse 31. Look at verse 31. Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? I love it. Paul always anticipates exactly how people are going to object, and then he heads them off at the pass. Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. Say, what? What What do you mean? How is the law upheld? I thought you just said we're all justified apart from the works of the law, that we have nothing to do with it. He says, no, the law is upheld, actually, in the gospel. How is the law upheld? Let me tell you two ways the law is upheld. First of all, the law is upheld because it's been fulfilled in Jesus. As I said before, God, we all stand accountable before God for our sin. We have broken his, sin, his law and we deserve God's punishment because of our sin. And when Jesus came, he did two things on our behalf. First of all, as we already said, he took the punishment that we deserve for our sin on the cross. But secondly, and this is what people often miss, Jesus lived a perfect life and completely and perfectly obeyed and fulfilled God's law. In other words, you could say it this way. Jesus lived a life that we should have lived And he died the death that we should have died. He did it all. In other words, God didn't set aside our punishment. And he didn't set aside the demands of the law. He says the demands of the law have to be fulfilled completely and perfectly. And the punishment has to be meted out completely. And Jesus did all of it for us. He took the full punishment. He fulfilled the perfect law. And that means when you place your faith in Jesus Christ, something miraculous happens. Theologians call it the great exchange. 
When you put your faith in Jesus, everything that he has becomes yours and everything you have become, becomes his. So he takes all of our sin, but that's only half the equation. We receive all his righteousness. And so the reason that you can stand before God and be accepted by God is because if you're a Christian and you believe in Jesus, God looks at you and he no longer sees your sin, your imperfect record. He looks at you and he sees Christ's perfect record, which has been given to you and imputed to you. And so you can be fully accepted by God. Isn't that the most freeing truth in the world? People spend their entire lives torturing themselves, trying to make themselves right with God and recognizing deep down that they can never, ever do it. The good news of the gospel is that a righteousness has been revealed, but you can't get it by following the law. You can't get it by trying harder. You can only get it by trusting in Jesus so that his righteousness can be imputed to you. Your sin can be given to him and you are justified. You are saved. So, Paul says, in verse 26, God is both just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. He's just because he punishes sin and he didn't ignore sin, but he's the justifier because he provided a way for us to be declared righteous and accepted by him. So the law is upheld because it's been fulfilled in Jesus. But there's another reason it's upheld, and this is really important. It's also upheld because it remains the pattern for the Christian life. How do we know as Christians, as disciples, how do we know what pleases God? How do we know what God's will is? How do we know the way in which as disciples we are to live our lives? The answer is we continue to seek to follow his commands. Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And so the, the good news of the gospel, as I said a couple of weeks ago, is, is it's not just that we've been saved from something. We've been saved for something. We have been saved for a life of pursuing Christ and following his commandments. We're saved so that we can pursue this, not as a means of being accepted by God, but in response to being accepted by God. I don't want you to miss this. For Christians, obedience is not insignificant. A disciple is someone who seeks to be obedient to the Lord. But the motivation for our obedience is different than all the other religions in the world. All of the other religions of the world basically teach I obey, and therefore I'm accepted by God. Christianity teaches, I've been accepted by God, by his grace, therefore I obey. It's the exact opposite picture. Or to put it another way, we are not justified because of our obedience to the law. We are justified so that we may become obedient to God's law. And so for the Christian, God's law has not been nullified. Far from it. True disciples seek to follow the commands of the Lord with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength, but we don't do that out of a fear of God or trying to earn his acceptance. We do it because we love Christ because of what he has given us, and we want to live our lives in a way that pleases him. So as we step back and look at this picture this morning, I hope that you can see several things about what it means to be a disciple. A disciple is someone who knows we have no righteousness of our own. A disciple is someone who knows that we can only be justified or declared righteous because of what Christ has done through faith in Christ. And therefore, a disciple knows that we have nothing to boast about before God because we did nothing to earn it and we did nothing to deserve it. And a disciple seeks to follow God's law, not to earn his favor, but because we love Christ and want to please him. Some of these realities have been captured beautifully in the classic hymns of the church. And one of the hymns we just sang earlier this morning, Rock of Ages, reminds us of this truth, that we could never save ourselves. We can only be saved by trusting in what Jesus has done for us. So I want to leave you with these words this morning. The second verse says, not the labors of my hands can fulfill thy law's demands. 
Could my zeal no respite know? Could my tears forever flow? All for sin, they could not atone. Thou must save, and thou alone. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace. We're reminded this morning, Lord, that if we were left to ourselves, we could never be saved. But we thank you that you did not leave us to ourselves. You sent your son to rescue us, to die as an atonement for our sins. And so, Lord, I pray this morning that you would impress these truths upon our hearts. Lord, I pray that if there's someone here this morning who has never understood or heard these truths and is understanding them for the first time, that you would enable that person to turn to you this morning and trust in you and believe in you, recognizing that you are the one and only Savior and that you alone can take away our sin and make us right with you. Help us to live as people who know we've been saved by grace. Lord, if we have been guilty of boasting, eliminate that boasting from our hearts and remind us that we have nothing to brag about we can only point others to you. We give you all the glory, all the praise this morning. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.